Uh, it looks like a little over half of you are here. I am going to start class nonetheless. I want to try to finish within the secret of time today. Most of our classes, so most of our classes would go on up to 90 minutes. I am not sure if we'll get to 90 minutes today, but we will see what happens. So I want to welcome everybody. I trust that everybody is well and the COVID free and that you will continue to keep safe and you are doing your best to handle whatever situations are presented by the current crisis. Today we are going to, well, this week's topics were safety and security. In our life class, I am only going to look at safety in the life class. Security is a very small topic, which will be covered, which is covered in the Kawasa online platform. I want to remind you that we have protocol set for when we have classes. So reminding you to keep your mics on mute unless you are gonna be speaking to the class and limit the use of video so that we could control the bandwidth of the session. So let me welcome you again, Gregory. Yes, we can see you. Good morning. Finally, Good morning. finally get back internet, but I um, still have a little bit of glitches in the system. So they tell me I could go ahead and use today while they work on the system. They say it shouldn't cut off. So I know I got some catching up to do, but I ain't got no choice. It wasn't my fault. Okay. I had, yeah, a you've, had a death. You've explained to me. Um, so we understand, but it just means now you have to put in the necessary work. So you have to go ahead. Not not cutting you off. I have I have everything basically right now going against me. I'm the only worker for my department on this island. So I'm an emergency worker. I'm on 24 hour call. I still have to wow. do the regular duties. As a husband, I have to do everything. And it, it's the load is up here, you know, but thank God I'm still around that I could go ahead, you know what I mean? Okay, a man has to do what he has to do. Yeah, so you gotta bear with me. Yeah. I, got, I know I got to try to do some tests and stuff and some a lot of reading to catch back up, but I'll do my best. Okay, as you need assistance, you will let me know. Okay. All right. So, I'll listen so let's now. go into class. I will be sharing my screen. Okay. So I said earlier that I am only going to be looking at safety today because uh, I feel that security is well covered in what has been given on the Colossal Online site. So we want to look at safety and now we are we're looking at the same three objectives, identify components of a safe, safety compliance program, identify causes of accidents, and review regulatory requirements. Now, some of the content, I will go over it a little bit differently um, than what is done on the Kawasa online class. Also, I have some, I mean, you may see some additional information that is not covered there as well. So let's go ahead. Uh, safety, okay, there's an error there. That should be S-A-F-E-T-Y. So there's a typo. All right, what is safety? Before we even discuss any of the things that surround this topic, what is safety? In your opinion, what is safety? Anybody cares to give an answer? Or what do you understand by the term safety? If safety could probably be making sure that first of all, you and your environment, your things around you, in your environment that you're working in, 
is safe, preventing bad things from happening to you, getting injured or stuff like that, corner off areas. Okay. Yeah, all right, very good. Um, some good points. Injuries. You want to prevent injuries or harm. Now, at my definition, freedom from the occurrence or risk of injury, danger, or loss. Okay? Notice that the risk of danger is also considered when we are looking at safety. Okay? Because if you eliminate the risk, then you eliminate the possibility of danger, injury, or loss. Okay, so that is also important. Both the occurrence and the risk are things that we want to look at. Okay. So why would safety at work be important to any of you? As operators, think of yourselves as operators. Why is it important for you to be safe at work? Why would you want to be safe at work? Anybody well, cares to you, share on that? You would, want, you would want to be safe at work because in order for you to carry out your duties, what you're being hired to do, you, you have to be safe. At you and get no at all. You wouldn't be able to provide no service or anything if you get injured. Okay. What happens if you are not safe at work? It could compromise a lot of other things. It, the chances are that you may not be able to work further. You may not be as productive. Or if we look at the extreme, you may not be able to work again if you are not safe at work okay so the employer as well as the employee has a duty and a responsibility to ensure that the environment is safe and the methods and practices carried out at work are safe so things are we want to make sure things are done safely but we also want to make sure that the environment and you said the way the environment, the work environment is safe, set up is as safe as possible. So there are a few safety hazards that as operators in distribution, you may come across. Also treatment, maybe some of these may also be important for treatment operators. Okay, first one, traffic. So I will just list all of them. We'll go through them in a bit. So I have about six of them here. Okay, so traffic, fires, confined spaces, chemical and gas exposure, excavation and trenching, electrical and dangerous atmospheres. Now, dangerous atmospheres or hazardous atmospheres, we so often look at it in the same thing as confined species. So we often look at these together because very often confined species may have atmospheres that are dangerous to the operator. So let's look at them. We're going to start with traffic. Okay. Many times when distribution operators have to do repairs or installations, it is done on the street. Okay. And there might be live traffic on the street while it's being done. Because in most of our islands, the pipes are either placed on the side of the road or under the road, okay? So that exposes operators to many opportunities for getting involved in accidents, involving traffic, okay? So there are a few things that we want to look at. Employees can be struck by vehicles or mobile equipment as they are working. So we want to prevent that. So it is necessary to control traffic at the work site. And we have traffic control devices, signals, and message boards instruct drivers to follow paths away from where work is being done. Okay. And in the picture a while ago, we saw a guy holding a sign, a sign used to control traffic. And that guy, we would call him a flagger. Okay. Because he basically flags traffic and tells them what they can and cannot do. He directs them where they should go. And he uses a set of standard signs and signals to direct that traffic. Okay. Also, approved traffic control devices are also used inside of work zones. Okay. So, work zone traffic safety. 
Now, most of the information that will be discussed here is coming straight from OSHA. Okay, so most of the information is coming straight from OSHA. Now, if you have any questions and so on, you can post them in the chat. I will be glancing at the chat occasionally to, to see your questions and to respond to them. If I don't answer right away, it is not because I don't want to, but I'm juggling a full screen here. And um, so I have to actually not leave the full screen, but pull up the menu to see if there are any messages in the chat. Okay. The other thing you can do is to use the raise, raise your hand feature. That I should see an alert when you do it and I can respond um, in a quicker manner. Okay. So work zone traffic safety, work zone protection. So various concrete, water, sand, collapsible barriers, crash cushions and truck mounted attenuations can help limit motor racism intrusions into construction work zones. Now, most of what is mentioned here are kind of barriers. Most of them are barriers. Uh, we have concrete ones. Sometimes we use what we call, what we have in some countries on roads, they call them medians. Sometimes these are used to zone off work areas. Sometimes we have water in these plastic drums full of water. So if a vehicle is coming at a, a certain speed and the vehicle sees or responds to traffic not notifications late, they end up heating into these things and not into the job site and not into any employees. Now the truck mounted attenuator is pictured here to the right, to the right, to my right. Okay, you could see there's a truck at the front here and this thing is almost like a trailer that is attached to the truck with these um high, these are high reflective, high and visibility um, sign at the back. So what happens if something is coming, it would end up heating into that instead of going straight into the side. So that will kind of cushion um, the blow of the vehicle. So it stop, prevents the vehicle outright from ending up in the site. It also, also this one has lights at the top, okay, which can tell traffic to either go left or right. Okay. So we continue the work area, flagging. So flaggers should wear high visibility clothing with fluorescent background and made of retro reflective material. And you will notice that OSHA is saying that this should be visible from at least a thousand feet away. If we're working on some place like, especially highways, the speed limit is higher and drivers tend to drive much faster. Okay, and if you're a driver, you will know about braking distance and all that kind of stuff. So you want to give the driver enough time so that he sees the flagger and he can slow down in time. So 1,000 1, feet is a bit more than what the driver would need, yeah, I think. But it's better to be um, overcautious in this regard because we cannot control what motorists do on the road, but we have to protect ourselves as, as operators and as persons who are working in these kinds of areas, you, you, must put, you must be protected. Okay, drivers should be warned with signs that there will be flaggers ahead. Okay, so even before the driver sees the flag or before he is close to the flagger, there should be signs saying, you know, that something is happening ahead. We can use things like cones to indicate that something is happening ahead. So from the time the motorist sees the cones, you might see a sign saying men at work. You might see a sign saying, um, indicating that there's a flagger ahead. Then you catch the driver's attention and the driver knows that something is ahead, so he will drive more cautiously. OSHA also requires that flaggers must be 
trained and certified because flaggers are supposed to be using standard signals and signs. And if they're not trained that they don't know what these standard signals are, they may not be able to communicate effectively with motorists. Okay, so there are standards that they have to meet. Flaggers should use stop or slow paddles, paddles with lights or flags only in emergencies. Okay. So fire, so that leaves traffic fire. Okay. Now, a fire risk is a risk that could leave property damage that could also cause um, loss of life or some major injuries. And so we want to take every effort to prevent fires. Now, note I said prevent, okay? Because with fire safety, the best policy is prevention. If you can prevent the fire, then all the risk that and the possibility of harm and, and so on, all these things are eliminated if you can just prevent the fire. So we must take means not only to have things there for if a fire occurs, but to have practices and policies in place that will help to prevent fires in the first place. So every worker should be trained or should know the location, sorry, of fire extinguishers. Every worker should also be trained to use the fire extinguishers. Okay, because if even if you have the fire extinguishers and people don't know how to use them, in case there's a fire, they will not be able to stop the fire because they are still figuring out how to use the extinguishers or the fire will begin to engulf the location because of the response time. Because if you're trying to figure out how to use the extinguishers, it means that the, the fire is growing and growing and growing while you're trying to figure out how to put it out. Okay, so and fires tend to, some fires tend to advance rather quickly. So every minute counts for some fires. Okay, so we want to ensure that workers know how to use the extinguishers as well as know where the extinguishers are. Okay, I want to go back to the sign I had previously. Okay, so, so this here is a workplace fire safety procedure. Okay, I'm not sure if you can read it, but I will read so you could, so you could hear. Most places have a fire alarm. So if there's a fire, your first action should be to not panic, but to press the fire alarm, okay? Especially if the risk of the fire growing is very great, okay? And also you may not have been able to put that fire out. It might be too, too far advanced for you with your little fire extinguisher, because most places, a lot of businesses and commercial places have a smaller fire extinguisher and these, are te these tend to be used when the, the fire has just started and has not spread much, okay? Second thing to do is to call a fire brigade or fire station. Leave the building by the nearest emergency exit. Now, this means in most places have emergency exits and they are labeled. Most of them are, I believe, trying to recall whether it's a green sign with white text or a red sign with white text, but most commercial places are required to have exits, emergency exits, and they are well labeled and people should know where these exits are. As a matter of fact, most um, places should have some kind of emergency plan. In case of fire, what are we going to do? Okay, where are we going to meet? after we leave the building, who is responsible for whom? 
Yeah. So all of these things must be in that plan. People should know what the plan is. So when something happens, they know what to do. Okay. Do not stop to collect personal belongings. So if there's a fire, your business is not with collecting things, okay? Your business is to ensure that you are safe. So you want to remove yourself from the building that is on fire and go to a place of safety. Usually places of safety would be designated in the fire emergency plan, okay? Now, when you get to the designated place, meeting place outside, the responsible, a person's responsible, um, if, it, if it is supervisors who are responsible for the units, they must take account of the persons who are there. That will help us know whether someone is missing. Sometimes in case of emergency, you may not be thinking so clearly, that you can watch whoever is there and say, oh, we're missing this person or that person. So it's necessary to do a count and to see if everybody's there, if somebody's missing, find out that person's location and ensure that that person is not in the burning building. Do not return to the building until authorized to do so. You are not a firefighter. If there's a fire, you have no business going back into that burning building. You have not been trained to deal with this situation. And what you may end up doing is putting yourself in, 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 in harm's way. Okay? So you might think that you're going to save somebody and both of you, God forbid, may end up perishing in the blaze. Okay? Report to your assembly point, I already said that. Do not use the elevator, use the stairs. Can somebody tell me why you think this statement is there about not using the elevator, but using the stairs? Maybe because in the event of a fire, electricity may be gone. Or, mm -hmm. or, or if electricity ain't gone, it might cause the elevator to also jam while you're on the way using it. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. I think there's still another point that needs to be mentioned though. Can somebody else? Well, I guess too, probably the elevator by opening and closing the doors could probably help fuel the fire with oxygen. Mm. So I don't know. Not that direction I'm going, but that's possible. Yep. Can somebody else try? Um, I want to hear some other voices. I guess, you basically, I guess you basically don't want to trap, to have any additional persons trapped in confined spaces so you don't want to create an additional hazard by having somebody else trapped in an elevator at the given point in time okay i like a word that you mentioned which is, which is in the direction as going confined spaces because what can happen in that elevator is you could have one low oxygen levels because the elevator is essentially a confined space two you could have some gases that could damage your respiratory system. So you could have hazardous gases there as well, as well as extreme temperatures. Okay, so that's three things that could happen in the elevator. In addition to what Gregory said, what Gregory said was quite valid. So that was our first point. So electricity may, may be out, okay? Because what happens if there's a fire and wires start burning, right? then electricity may go out while you are trying to go in the go down through the elevator and the elevator will just stop wherever it is and you're trapped okay and the elevator can have a hazard, hazardous conditions in terms of oxygen availability and toxic or, or, or dangerous gases or dangerous gas levels so very good so let me get back to where we were. Okay, so keep workplace neat and orderly. Okay, this is important in preventing fires. Sometimes you're working with certain substances that should not be near each other. You may be working with substances that should not be where, near water. Okay, and uh, we have some substances like sodium, sodium metal, if you ever 
get to use sodium metal. I remember when I was younger, when we were doing chemistry, we used to take the sodium metal and bring it outside. Don't try this at home. And we used to put a, a thing of water and then drop the sodium in the thing of water because sodium reacts exclusively with water. So if we had a glass container, I'm just saying if we had, I'm not saying we need it a glass container. You can imagine whatever you want. But if we had, had a glass container, um, we would put the water in a glass container and then drop the sodium in. And the sodium would start to react explosively. You would see sparks and fire and everything. And as the thing built up, the glass would just break and glass would be shattered all over the place. Okay? So it's very, uh, kind of an exciting experiment, but please don't try it. Um, it's not safe. Or if you're going to try it, make sure that you have your personal protective equipment on. Okay? But these are some things that I found exciting about doing chemistry because you have all these kinds of crazy reactions that you could try and um, the sights, the sounds, and, and so on. I found, I always found this exciting about chemistry. All right, now we have different types of fire and we classify these fires based on how they are started. Okay, and it's important for you to know this. Okay, for you to know the different classes of fire. We classify them into A, B, C, D, and then there's a special classification for cooking. Okay, which you, we usually don't discuss this K classification when we are doing water distribution, but I decided to put it in there anyway. Okay, so A is ordinary combustibles, wood, paper, cloth, etc. So things of that nature, that's class A fires. Now, if you look at the table we have here, the first column shows the letter symbol of the fire. The second column shows us, so these are stickers that you may have this sticker, these letter stickers, as well as these picture stickers on the fire extinguishers that would be used. Okay. So if you see these stickers on your fire extinguisher, it means the fire extinguisher can be used for that particular fire, okay? So the first one, green, is ordinary combustibles. The second one is flammable liquids and common things, grease, oil, paint, solvents. Fuels would come under there, um, kerosene, diesel, and gas, all of these things would come on the head, on the hair. So these are class B fires. Class C fires are, have to do with light electrical equipment. And these are electrical panels, motors, or wiring, anything that can lead to sparks. If there's a shot, then you could have sparks, and the sparks can lead to the ignition of other substances. Okay, now, from the time we get to C, you should begin to appreciate why we want to indicate what fire extinguisher should be used for what. Because water, for instance, is a fire extinguisher. Water is something that we use very often to add fires. But in case of electrical fires, we would not want to use water. Why would we want to use water in case of electrical fires, anybody? Water wouldn't have, uh, water wouldn't have spread, spread the fire. Um, like I think electricity travel with water, so that wouldn't be um, right to use if okay, you use water because, in electrical power. Okay, very good. So electricity is water is a conductor of electricity. That's the proper term that we use, a conductor, which means if the electrical current will travel through the water. Very often when we have fires, we have people standing on the side of the road, um, even sometimes when they put a barricade, people don't want to stay. That's in the Caribbean. People don't want to stay within the, the barricade. They want to see what's happening up close. Okay. Also, you may have persons who are still trapped in the burning building. If there's an, electric, is it an electrical fire and you start using rock point water there, 
there's a possibility that that electricity will electrocute the persons who are trapped in the building. If that water gets all over the place, persons who are outside are at risk as well. So for these fires, we don't use that, okay? We don't use water for some of the class D fires as well. Um, because the class D fires, for instance, if your fire was started by chemicals, say you had some sodium stored, I mentioned sodium before, so I'm just using it again. Say you had some sodium stored in a, in a, a kind of side room in a, a lab, right, at the treatment plant, and there's a fire. If you use water, the water will just add, it's like you're adding fuel to the fire because the, the substance reacts explosively with water. So you would not be able to put, out, put that fire out with water. Okay? And as I'm already at class D. So these are combustible metals. And the combustible metals include zinc, magnesium, aluminum, aluminum sodium, potassium. Okay? All of these can um, be combustible in terms of fires. Okay? So we want to be careful with what we use for these. Most times for these last two ones, we use some kind of dry um, powder extinguisher, but we're going to look at them in a minute. Okay, and then we have the commercial fires. Okay, so use the correct fire extinguisher for the class of fire. So that's if you know what class of fire it is. Sometimes you can assess, and because you know what was in the vicinity where the fire is most times if you're at a commercial place. So you can make an educated guess in terms of what may have started the fire. So you know what fire extinguishers to use. And also in placement of fire extinguishers based on what is being done at the location, we would usually choose a fire extinguisher to put there that is appropriate for the possible fire hazards that exist here in that location. Okay, I keep looking to see their questions. Okay, so here, some fire, different forms of fire extinguishers. We have water, we have dry powder, we have foam, we have carbon dioxide, that's the formula for carbon dioxide. And then we have a wet chemical fire extinguisher. Now I got this diagram online and I thought it was very appropriate for what we were doing. If you look, it talks about the use, what, what each one can be used for. Okay, so let's look at water. We use it on combustible wood, paper, textiles, etc. But we do, so that's class A fires. We do not use on class B fires. We do not use on class C fires. And it does not mention class D, but we don't use it on class D fires. Okay. Dry powder, dry powder, we can, we can use the dry powder on almost every type of fire, okay? It doesn't have liquid in it, so it will not conduct electricity, okay? It will work on class A, B, C fires, okay? Use, now notice class D is not mentioned here. Um, reason being, in terms of dry powder, there is that way, for the dry powder that we use for class B, they, they usually specialize um, dry powder extinguishers for class D. So we don't use them here. That's not the only extinguisher for class D, but we don't use these, um, these, these regular dry powder for, the, for that kind of fire. So um, wood, paper, textiles, so class A and B but we don't use it for C and D. Carbon dioxide, we use for class B, okay? B and C, okay? But we don't use for A and B, okay? And we try not to use that in a confined space. Can somebody tell me why we don't want to use carbon dioxide extinguishers in a confined space? Yeah, I want that. So that wouldn't be a poisonous gas. That wouldn't be able to kill you. Um, if you're constant, it's not necessarily poisonous. You think of carbon monoxide. Oh yeah. Which is carbon CO. Monoxide. Okay. But what happens? You basically, if you use that, you increase the amount of carbon dioxide 
in the confines. It's no, also rem remember that you take breathe, away oxygen. You breathe in oxygen and you breathe out okay, yeah. carbon dioxide. Okay. So if you're increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in a confined but, space, it's not good for you. Yeah, take away oxygen. Yeah, not necessarily take away, but it's not good. That concentration is not good for you at all. Yeah. And in confined spaces, usually the amount of oxygen that's available. The